There's never been a billionaire businessman quite like Sir Richard Branson. He's part entrepreneur, part adventurer, part crusader and 100% showman. But the boss of the Virgin Empire is having such an extraordinary life, he's just written another autobiography. And now there's even material for a third book, because when I sat down with him in New York, it was only days after he'd survived Hurricane Irma, the ferocious storm that wiped out his island paradise in the Caribbean. Take one. So I come all the way from a war striven country and you give me a cold cup of tea. I mean, yeah, if Richard Branson like looks like exhausted, cold he cold is. Cup. He's just come from his home in the British Virgin Islands, which was devastated by Hurricane Irma. The whole nation has been destroyed. You know, the strongest hurricane in history, um, over 200 miles an hour. Branson and 70 others were forced to shelter for nearly eight hours as his island was being ripped apart. When the eye of the storm came about around us, then suddenly it goes completely quiet. I mean, from you know, screaming, you know, howling winds, it's suddenly deathly hush. And you're never quite sure whether that means it's gone or whether you're in the eye of the hurricane. So, you know, we opened the door slightly, just, just went outside and, you know, looked down at what had been, you know, perhaps the most beautiful island and the most beautiful, you know, in, in, and just saw utter devastation. And I've never cried over, you know, loss of, um, loss of things or property, but I think all of us had t tears in our eyes. So everything was wiped out? Everything was, yeah, just completely wiped out. Branson's shock is understandable. Hello. When I first met him 17 years ago, we travelled to his home on Necker Island. It was an extraordinarily beautiful place, enjoyed by pop stars, princesses, and presidents. Branson and his wife Joan have lived here full time for more than a decade. It's where they married, and it's where Richard scattered his father's ashes. Losing it all was a chapter he never got to write in his new autobiography. In all the bad news, there's a bit of good news. You've got a book. <laughs> I wonder what you had what you had sitting on your lap. <laughs> yes, uh, let me be the first to say, here's your book. Uh, how exciting. Well... Um, I'm told it's easy to open. Let's see. Uh, let's have a look. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> you, I'm, not in, I'm not ready for opening not difficult packages. For a life that has always seemed so blessed, it actually had a brutal beginning. When Branson was sent to boarding school when he was just seven. You know, you got, you got beaten until you bled and, and at that kind of age. And um, A lot of that was based on also not realising that you had dyslexia and being portrayed as someone who was simple, I think is the word that you used. How frustrating was that period of your life? Um, it's tough uh, when, you know, you're thought of as stupid and, and you're thought of as not trying, but you just actually can't deliver. And actually, most likely, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because um, out of my dyslexia, I, bizarrely, uh, for a dyslexic, uh, decided to, to start a magazine to give, to give young people a voice. Branson was only 16 when he left school, but he was always determined and trusted his instincts. When he started Virgin Records in 1973, he signed unknown 20-year-old Mike Oldfield, whose album, Tubular Bells, sold over 16 million copies. The Virgin stable quickly grew and included the Sex Pistols and the Rolling Stones. 
then the business pushed out into planes, trains and automobiles. Today, it controls more than 400 companies. You didn't just become any old businessman. You became outrageously successful. What do you put that down to? Um, well, I have um, a big inquisitiveness um, of life. And I, if I get frustrated by something, I feel, you know, I'll, I will leap in and try to improve it. And I suppose I've been frustrated a lot of times in my life because I've you done, sure have. <laughs> done, done it on a lot of different occasions. And if his empire isn't already big enough, Branson is now branching out into space. He's about to become an astronaut and his Virgin Galactic rockets will be taking paying customers with him. And you have no doubt we're going to get there? Um, I, would, I would hope that um, in, the, in the early months of next year I'll be in space, so I'm determined to be an astronaut. So you're that close? Yeah, we are that close. You're headed for space? Yes. Do you know you're going next year? Yes. And you're OK? Yeah, when, when I actually get that date on the dotted line that I'm going, I might get nervous. Dr um, Holly Branson is Richard's 35-year-old daughter. It's a nice whole family pick. I have a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Richard and his wife Joan have been together for 40 years. Holly has a brother, Sam, and there are now four grandchildren. In spite of all the fame and fortune, Holly says it is all about family for her father. We never talked about money as, as children. Um, we knew we had nice houses and we had a you know, like nice upbringing with holidays we went on. But the main thing was just the love of the family and money, money wasn't really spoken about. It must have been, though, a little surreal to see the number of celebrities who would come through your lives, though. I mean, to me, I didn't normal. notice. <laughs> I didn't know who they were. I really, um, especially from a young age, I would have age, I'd have Janet Jackson come to the door and I'd have, um, we'd have Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, I did know who he was. I was a bit older then when he came for lunch. But when I was younger, I had no idea who all these people were that were coming through the house. And it was quite funny looking back, at, sometimes looking back at old photos and be like, Oh my God, I was with Mick Jagger when I was five years old and I had no idea who they were. Mr Murdoch, did you say sorry? If there was a downside to being a famous and powerful family, it came thanks to Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation and the 2011 phone hacking scandal, which had also targeted Branson and his children. When you found that out, that must have been particularly horrifying. It's unpleasant. Uh, fortunately, I'm a happily married man, so there was nothing for him to find out. Do you think that's what he was looking for? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure that's what they that's... were looking for. Yeah, absolutely certain they were looking for that. But anyway, they made a payment to charity and we... Were, yes, and, you settled yeah. financially. Mm. But you did say that he was bad for democracy. Yeah, look, the, the reason I felt that he was dangerous for democracy in the UK was um, you know, there was a time where, you know, he could almost decide which, which government got into power. I think in Australia there was a, there was a time, that, you know, that, that, um, uh, there as well. Um, I think he's now much more interested in who gets into power in America. If Rupert Murdoch thought Donald Trump would make a good president, Richard Branson didn't. From their first meeting, Branson knew he and Donald Trump would never be friends. I had one um, meal with him and we hadn't met before and all he talked about was how he was going to destroy five people who had not helped him when he was bankrupt and, uh, and he'd rung them up asking for financial help and they'd said no. And, uh, and, uh, and I just thought this sounded like a very vindictive individual. And when I saw that he was running for president, I, I, I was worried that somebody you know, like that 
could, could possibly end up you know, effectively being the most powerful person in the world. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. Right now, Branson is particularly unimpressed with Trump's stand on climate change, having just survived one of the most powerful hurricanes on record. I'm, I, you know, I was so angry when I saw what had happened. I must admit, the first thing that came to mind was, um, you know, was Donald Trump and his denial of climate change, and it just, it, it just angered me so much. Richard Branson is probably the world's highest profile environmental refugee. But of course, there's no need to worry about this homeless billionaire. This quintessential Australian, I've got to say, the <laughs> little tinny. He has luxury bolt holes around the globe, including here on Queensland's Makepeace Island in the Noosa hinterland. I'm quite a, quite a bit in the public eye, so it's quite nice to have an island and draw up the drawbridge occasionally. Um, but, um, but because we don't come here a lot, um, we share it with other people, and you know, and, and so we just rent the rent the island out when we're not here. Branson has always been very comfortable in Australia. <laughs> His godfather was Australian, and only recently. Come here. Yes. He learned his ancestors moved here in the 1850s. Are we ready? Oh, oh I right. think, <laughs> hang on, I now realise. <laughs> Are we ready? Uh, 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 oh, that's almost... His love of Australia now extends to our wildlife, and in particular, our koalas. Where does this love of uh, the koala come <laughs> from? I just have an, an enormous love of uh, species that are in peril because <laughs> I think it, it, it's a sin for us to uh, let, let species disappear. So With local koala numbers crashing, Branson is backing research to help save them and plans to turn Make Peace Island into a koala conservancy. It kind of goes to the heart of you a bit though, doesn't it? You've always had this desire to imp improve the world and keep the good bits, if you like. I, th I think if you get yourself into a position where you can actually make a difference, then, then it's, fun it's a wonderful, wonderful privilege to try to do something about it. And, um, and I guess that is the thing, isn't it? You've, you have found yourself in a position where you can do something. Uh, is, is that one of the wonderful things about being successful? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think the fact that you know, I can pick up the phone to pretty well anybody in the world and get through. And, you know, I'm damned if I'm going to waste, you know, waste that position I find myself in. And, so what do you uh, do? Do you pick up and say, hi, it's Richard here, <laughs> and you know the one? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> At 67, Richard Branson still has enormous energy and passion. He has lived a high-octane life taking everything to the limit. And as far as he's concerned, there's plenty more to come. We mean it, man. Um, just finally, uh, do you have any regrets at this point? None at all, no. And I think I'd be a sad person if I had any regrets. Um, none, none whatsoever? Honestly, none whatsoever. I mean, I had a blast and we'll continue. Um, I'm already working on, on, um, on the next book. <laughs> so.